Our guest of honor tonight is Mr. Kent Harriff. Mr. Harriff is the author of Plain Song, which was a National Book Award finalist and the winner of the Mountain and Plains Booksellers Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Maria Thomas Award in Fiction, and the New Yorker Book Award. His novel, The Tie That Binds, received a Whiting Foundation Award and a special citation from the Penn Hemingway Foundation. In 2006, he was awarded the Dos Passos Prize for Literature. I think we were all very excited to also learn that Mr. Harriff was born in Pueblo. <laughs> He's joined tonight by his lovely wife, Kathy. Please, Pueblo, join me in welcoming Mr. Kent Harriff to our PCCLD stage. I wrote Plain Song over about a six-year period. And uh, during that time, uh, many things happened to me, including a divorce and, uh, and a marriage. And so it took me a long time, and I'm a slow writer anyway. I had a very uh, deliberate intention in writing that book. The previous two books that I had written were written in the first person with a narrator telling the story. And in both cases, the narrator was sort of at the edge of those stories, somewhat like the narrator of The Great Gatsby. But when it came time to write Plain Song, I, run, I wanted to switch to, to the third person and to uh, write it in, a, in an absolutely simple, hopefully clear and direct manner. If I had a lyrical ability like James Agee or William Faulkner, perhaps I could have written a more lyric book. But it, it was important to me to try to be as clear and direct. And also, because it is third person, it made it possible to, to write the book in an external way, to try to present characters in an external way. And my belief is that if I do that well enough, that you will end up caring about them, and that you will know them well enough to care about them. So you can be the judge of that, whether that succeeded or not. But certainly that was my intention. I, I mentioned that I write on an old manual typewriter. I started off writing that way, and then the second novel that I wrote, uh, I wrote on a computer. By that time, computers had come into use. And I never did like that. I, didn't, I missed the, the uh, sound of keys. I missed the tactile sensation of paper. I have a special fondness for old yellow paper that newspaper reporters used to write their copy on. You can't find it anymore, but I have several reams of it, and I think I have enough to, to finish up my career as a writer. When I went back to write Plain Song, I knew that I didn't want to do what I had done before. And also, I didn't want to get stopped by having to write the perfect sentence. If you get your mind in that particular predicament, no sentence that you write is good enough. Even somebody like Shakespeare sounds amateurish or maudlin if, you, if your mind is in that, in that uh, state. So instead of allowing myself to be stopped by, by diction or syntax or word choice or grammar or spelling error or punctuation or any of those things, I decided to write uh, blindly. And what I mean by that is I, I wrote that book and the, and the two books that I've written since then with my eyes shut. And so I typed on the typewriter and, uh, and typed a single page, single spaced, and, and uh, did not get up from the typewriter until I had written that, that scene all on one page, all in one sitting. And the idea was to, to try to write something spontaneous and natural without being stopped by those things I mentioned. People have been amused by the fact that sometimes I put a stocking cap over my eyes, down over my head, to make sure that I didn't open my eyes. But uh, I've done it often enough now that, that I, I don't use a stocking cap very much anymore. You might be interested in knowing a little bit about the names of the characters of some of them in Plain Song. The McFerrin brothers are named after my Uncle Paul and Aunt Elsie McFerrin, who used to live, they're both dead now, they used to live out in eastern Colorado, near the little town of Fleming, which is east of Sterling. And my uncle, Paul McFerrin, was a wheat farmer and a man that I admired. And, and his wife, Aunt Elsie, was my father's youngest uh, sibling. She was the last of 13 children. My father and she grew up in, on a homestead in North Dakota, a long way from school. So they had their own school teacher who lived with the family. And my father wanted to become educated, and so he, 
went off to Dickinson, North Dakota to be to go to high school and work his way through high school and all of that. But in any case, my Aunt Elsie was very dear to me. And so when it came time to name the two old brothers, I wanted to give them a name that meant something to me. And so I named them McFerrin. And uh, after the book was published, I sent a copy to Uncle Paul and Aunt Elsie. And uh, about two weeks later, I got a letter from Aunt Elsie and she said, well, we got your book. It wasn't what we expected. <laughs> but then she said, but it was good anyway. So I appreciated that and took that as some kind of a compliment. Uh, Victoria Rubido, the young girl, is named, her last name comes from my family history and my mom's side in South Dakota. Her father was a, a sheep rancher and a wheat farmer and he rented land from a woman whose last name was Rubido, an Indian woman from the Rosebud Reservation. And so that name, Rubido, has been in our family history for a long time. And again, I wanted to, to use a name that had some meaning for me, at least privately. The two little boys are somewhat like my brother Mark and me. Uh, we had a paper out when we lived in various towns. And that incident with the barber, where he uh, humiliates the two little boys, uh, came out of our experience, and that's my revenge on that barber. <laughs> and the old woman, uh, Mrs. Starnes, who lives upstairs over Main Street, that was not her name, and I don't remember the woman's name, but there were several old women who did live up over Main Street, and my brother and I uh, delivered papers to these long, dark hallways to the people in them, and it all seemed, always seemed kind of scary to us at our ages to go into those, those dark apartments. But I had a great affection for Mrs. Starnes, and, uh, and she came out of my experience. Okay, thank you. The question is, who, what writers were influential to me in the development of my writing? And I should uh, say, too, that I was a very slow learner. I, uh, I've been writing for almost 45 years now. And, uh, and I went to the writer's workshop at Iowa when I was 30 and studied writing in a formal way, but even then, I did not publish anything until I was 41. And so I'd spent that time trying to learn my craft. And, uh, but the writers that I read most intently and still do were the two great uh, 20th century American fiction writers, William Faulkner and, and Ernest Hemingway. I still read them nearly every day. When I can sit down to write, write, I write a little bit in a journal, and then I read something that I've read 50 times before, and I'm simply trying to get my mind uh, thinking about sentences and away from bills or my kids or whatever. And, uh, uh, and so I often go back, or almost every day go back and read something by Faulkner. The writer that means the most to me in my recent uh, life is the Russian writer Chekhov. And uh, if you know his writing, then you know that he writes simply and directly, and, and he makes tragedy out of trivialities. He is he's an astonishing writer, and to me, now I would say he was one of the very best fiction writers ever. So those writers are people that I have attempted to learn from, uh, and I still hope I am. I, I thank you again for coming tonight and supporting this library and supporting this program. It's a great honor to me and Kathy to be here, and I again uh, congratulate you on this wonderful library. Thank you.